Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. On behalf of the EAST team, I'd like to say welcome. Uh, just some quick introductions here. Uh, my name is Jason Coleman. I'm the federal application scientist. Uh, the other members of the EAST team, which is the um, eastern part of North America, includes Todd Quichoff, who's the sales uh, director of the region, uh, Sri Kakumanu, who's the manager of the New England region, and then Pratik Goswami, who is the field application scientist for the New England region. Uh, so, you know, thank you again for, for joining us. And the topic today, we're going to talk about, you know, using the ribogreen assay to measure RNA encapsulation inside a lipid nanoparticle. Uh, next week, uh, June 17th, at the same time, our next webinar, I just want to introduce this, this to you. Uh, the speaker is going to be Dr. David Evans, who's the Chief Scientific Officer at Seronomics. And he's going to talk about the work that Seronomics had done uh, using our uh, nano assembler GMP system with their next gen microfluidics technology to scale up uh, a, a nanoparticle containing two different siRNAs. And this was all done under GMP conditions. All right, so with that being said, let me get started with uh, what we're going to talk about today. Uh, so the, the topic today, as you all know, is, is we're going to be quantifying RNA and lipid nanoparticles using a modified ribogreen assay. And the, and the reason for the modified comes into play is because it's modified with the sense that we need to measure RNA that's encapsulated inside of a lipid nanoparticle. Uh, so as well as doing the assay itself, you know, we'll go through those modifications and how that is done. Uh, so as I mentioned earlier, my name is Jason Coleman. I'm the field application scientist uh, for the North American uh, Eastern region. Uh, so I'm going to give some intro uh, um, about the ribogreen assay um, and how and kind of the overview of the of the assay how it's going to work. And then uh, after I'll go through a few slides, and then we're going to go to a video which is going to feature Andrew Brown. He's an R&D scientist that works out of uh, our headquarters in Vancouver, and he's going to take you through a step-by-step -step procedure on um, kind of a hands-on how to do the actual assay. And then when Andrew goes, after Andrew Dunn is going through the assay, uh, it'll come back to me, and I'll walk you through how to do the calculations in Excel. And then at the end, you know, we get to all your questions. Uh, Pratik is going to is going to come on board come online and he'll be the moderator for, for posing those questions and, and helping answering them. Uh, so just to get started here. Uh, so, so go through some background on the, of the essay itself. Uh, first thing I wanna ask ourselves is, um, so why do we need to quantify RNA? And really, and ultimately what is the um, assay gonna tell us so we really need to know the accurate dosing and what this assay will tell us, it'll tell us the amount of encapsulated RNA inside of the lipid nanoparticle. And that's important because our dose is gonna be based on uh, the amount of RNA that's encapsulated. And then it'll also tell us the encapsulation efficiency, uh, which is a you know, measure of how much of our RNA gets inside the lipid nanoparticle and gets encapsulated. And that's important because you know it's it's a um, you know poor encapsulation efficiency can result in in poor biological activity, and the other thing being uh, it's also a sign of kind of our, our quality. Where if we have you know poor encapsulation efficiency, you know either the the formulation is, isn't good or the process isn't isn't good for the lipid nanoparticle, uh, and then it's you know if if you know your encapsulation efficiency is you know, you can, you can see if there's any changes in product quality over time with, as you run, you know, different formulations. And also it's a way, you know, if, if you're looking at, um, you know, product stability or the stability of the lipid nanoparticle, you know, to be able to maintain that, that encapsulation efficiency is being maintained over time to make sure the, you know, RNA isn't leaching out of your particles or the particles aren't being damaged uh, by some way, shape or form. So, you know, as a, as a quick kind of summary, so what, so why ribogreen as the assay? Uh, so what ribogreen is, it's ultimately a, a dye that fluoresces when bound to RNA. Uh, so it gives you a very high detection um, limit. And it's, you know, as opposed to UV quantification method, you know, where you'd be prone to interference. 
you know, from other things in solutions, or, or particularly in this case, uh, interference from the uh, lipid nanoparticle. And if we look at the assay itself um, here, because what we want to do for as far as for encapsulation efficiency and what the, what the assay will tell us is we want to know the difference between the amount of RNA that's inside um, the lipid nanoparticle versus outside the lipid, lipid nanoparticle. And a big part of the assay and what we'll go through is you know, to know that difference, but there's no, so there's no easy way to measure um, the encapsulation or the RNA that's encapsulated directly. You know, part of the assay is, is lysing the, the lipid nanoparticles um, and then measuring the RNA after it's lysed out of the particles. And one thing to note here, you'll notice, so, so the ribogreen assay is specific for RNA. Um, so we'll go through you know, a lot of these procedures in, in reference to RNA, but just know um, you could use a peaker green assay for DNA and, it's, and really follow the same procedure. Uh, so what we're gonna talk about, uh, kind of the overview uh, for the, the, the mod modified ribogreen um, assay. And this is what, what Andrew is gonna go over with you. And I'll just kind of give a summary here. So step one is gonna prepare your buffers, uh, which includes the TE buffer and then also your Triton buffer. And then also um, you know, diluting your, your RNA to be within this, the standard range of the assay. And then plating all of your samples in a 96 volt plate. And then finally, as I mentioned, applying the Triton to lyse the, the particles, uh, preparing the standards. Um, and then ultimately incubating the particles uh, so that it can be lysed, um, preparing the reagent, and then um, it'll come back to me. Uh, uh, so Andrew will use a, um, a fluorescent plate reader to measure the fluorescence values, and I'll go over with you in Excel how to do those calculations. Uh, so we do have a video we like to go to now, and this video, it is a recording, just a, a heads up. Uh, because just to be able to fit this within the confines of a webinar, um, we did uh, want to abbreviate some things uh, that Andrew goes through. Um, so just bear that in mind as we go through it. Hi, everyone. My name is Andrew Brown. I'm a scientist here at Precision Nanosystems. Um, so today I'm going to be walking you through how to run a ribogreen assay. And that's for measuring the concentration of encapsulated mRNA uh, inside the LMPs. So this assay is based off of a modification of the ribogreen assay from Invitrogen. So when you buy um, the ribogreen kit from Invitrogen, it comes with a couple different components. The first is TE buffer. So this is, it comes as 20x TE buffer, which we're going to dilute down to 1x TE. And that's going to be the diluent for this assay. Uh, next is the ribogreen reagent. So this has already been allocated out. We usually allocate it in the dark and keep it in the dark and then only use a single aliquot once uh, for this assay as it is light sensitive. Um, the other component of the kit which is not shown here is an RNA standard. You can use the RNA standard that comes with the ribogreen kit. Um, however, if you have very sensitive dosing requirements, we do recommend that you use the um, mRNA that you're going to encapsulate in your LMPs. So when you prepare the mRNA for your Ignite formulations, just set aside a little bit for preparation of the standard. Um, so now we're going to uh, start with the plate setup. So uh, in, this, in this assay, we, we are going to be using the first row A as a reservoir for setting up the rest of the plate. So step A is just a mixing, mixing step. And then the plate, the wells that are actually going to be read are in rows B, C, D, and E. So B and C are replicates and D and E are replicates. B and C are going to contain our sample, TE buffer, and ribogreen reagent. So these are going to be measuring only um, the mRNA that's unencapsulated on the outside of the LMPs. Then for rows D and E, that's going to contain our sample, ribogreen, and T with Triton buffer. Um, so the Triton buffer uh, is bought separately, and we're using this to burst the LMPs. 
So by doing this, we're going to be measuring the total mRNA concentration. So uh, in this assay, what we're going to do in order to get the uh, encapsulated mRNA concentration is measure the total mRNA concentration in rows uh, D and E, and then measure the unencapsulated in rows B and C, and subtract those to get the encapsulated concentration. Um, finally, uh, we'll use rows F and G uh, for plating our standard. The first step of this protocol is to uh, do the buffer preparation. So the first thing we're going to do is prepare our 1x TE. Uh, I'll just take a moment to explain how we know how much sample to add to our assay plate. Uh, so the important thing to start with is the uh, concentration range in the standard curve for this assay. So the, the concentration range is 0.1 to 2.5 micrograms per mil. And so we're going to want to aim for the concentration of our sample in the well to be somewhere in the middle of the standard curve. So we're going to aim for about 1 microgram per mil of our sample uh, in the well. Now. Um, when we're preparing our LMPs, and if you're following the Genboy protocol, the last step is to concentrate your sample using Amicon centrifugal filtration units. Um, and we typically recommend that you concentrate back to the original volume of the formulation. So for example, if you started with two mils of formulation, then you'll concentrate in the Amicon back to about two mils. In this case, you will end up with an mRNA concentration in the range of somewhere between 20 and 150 micrograms per mil. In this case, the volume of uh, sample that you'll want to add into the first row is 15 microliters. However, there are some cases where you may want to concentrate your sample further, for example, for higher dosing. Um, so in that case, we're going to need to add less sample so you stay on the standard curve. So I have two sets of samples here. These first ones, I, we're following the typical Genboy protocol and just concentrating back to uh, the original formulation volume. And these ones I've concentrated further. So with these samples, I've concentrated them to one third of the original formulation volume. So I'm expecting a concentration three times higher. In that case, because for the original samples, we normally add 15 microliters, I'm only going to add five microliters for these samples. So now that we have our Triton buffer dissolved, we can start doing the plate setup. So in order to do that, the first thing we need to do is load TE buffer and then our sample into row A. And now to continue our plate setup, we need to start filling rows uh, B and C. So these are going to be our T only uh, wells. So we're going to again use a multi channel pipette and add 50 microliters of TE. So now our next step is to add the Triton buffer into uh, rows D and E. So again, I'm going to be using a multi-channel to do that. And so we have to be a little bit careful when we're pipetting the Triton because it is a surfactant and so it tends to bubble a lot. So I'm going to be using a reverse pipetting technique um, in order to do that uh, because having a lot of bubbles in the well can affect the fluorescence reading. Also make sure that the multi-channel pipette that you're doing uh, can hold uh, enough volume. So even though I'm only pipetting 50 microliters, I'm using a 300 microliter pipette here. So to do this, I'm going to start by depressing the plunger all the way to the second stop, then drawing up my liquid all the way to the top. And then I can go up and down a couple of times, and you can see already there's a lot of bubbling, so I'm just going to 
depress it all the way again and try again. And you can see a lot of bubbles happen with Triton. So now that's pretty good. There's not too many bubbles in there. Now to do my sample addition, I'm only going to depress to the first stop in the well. And I can just go directly. I don't need to eject all of the liquid yet. I can just go in for my second one. So just to summarize the plate setup that we've done so far, um, we've added our TE buffer and sample into row A. So that's an initial dilution, and we're also going to be using row A um, as a reservoir for adding our samples into the subsequent rows. Uh, we've added TE buffer, which are replicates are into rows B and C. So those are uh, two replicates, and then two replicates of our uh, Triton samples in rows D and E. So now what I'm going to be doing is adding are moving our, our sample from uh, row A into B, C, D, and E. And we just want to make sure, because I only was using a 15 microliter pipette, that we pipette up and down a couple of times, at least five. I think this is a little bit loose. Right, and then we're going to go down each row. And again, do a little bit of mixing. So the next step in our protocol is going to be setting up the RNA standard. Uh, to do that, we need to fig first figure out um, what the current concentration of our mRNA is so that we can figure out what dilutions we need to do in order to prepare the standard for the assay. So I have a small output of my mRNA here, um, and I'm going to use the nanodrop uh, first to figure out what its current concentration is. This RNA is just in water at the moment, so I'm going to first blank the nanodrop with water. Okay, so now that our blank is done, we're ready to measure our sample. And press measure. Okay, so it's reading 1,876 micrograms per mil. So now I'm going to do a quick calculation to figure out what concentrate or how much of this RNA I'm going to use to prepare uh, my standard. So I'm looking for a total concentration of 20 micrograms per mil, and it's currently at 1,876 micrograms per mil. So need to do quite a big dilution. Um, in total, we need less than 100 microliters for setting up uh, the standard in the plate, but I'm going to prepare a volume of 200 microliters um, so that we have a little bit extra, and often people uh, will typically do more than one assay in a day. So I'm just doing C1V1 equals C2V2 type calculation. So uh, 20 times 2 divided by. Six. 
Okay, so I need to add 2.13 microliters of uh, my mRNA stock into um, uh, 198 microliters of TE. So I'm just going to get that set up. I have a tube here for uh, my RNA standard. I'm just going to take directly from our TE reservoir. And 2.13 microliters of our RNA. Because I pipetted such a small volume, I'm just going to use the 200 again to make sure it's nicely mixed up. And I'm just also going to re-blank the nano drop because the first time we blanked in water, and now this is in TE. So I'm going to re-blank with TE buffer. And that's the blank. So in the ribogreen protocol, uh, in order to set this uh, uh, standard up, we need to have a starting concentration of mRNA of 20 micrograms per mil. Um, and we need the concentration range to be fairly narrow because even a small difference in the starting RNA concentration in the standard could play a big role in the actual concentration that you calculate. So for example, um, a two microgram per mil difference when you start from only 20 micrograms per mil is actually 10%. So that means that error will carry forward and your concentration could be up to 10% off of the true value. So we want to keep that this uh, standard preparation as close to 20 micrograms per mil as possible. And the acceptable range that we're looking for is about 19.5 to 20.5 micrograms per mil. So what I'm reading here is 24.3 micrograms per mil, which means I actually need to dilute this a little bit more. So I'm going to di do a dilution with uh, TE. And so I'm, because I'm over, I can also do um, a C1V1 equals C2V2 type calculation. Okay, so because I'm over, I need to do a dilution, and the total volume based on this current RNA concentration that I need is 243 microliters. So the current volume is 200, so I need to add an additional 43 microliters. Um, I'm actually not going to do this all at once. I'm going to do this a little bit empirically, where I'm going to say add about half the volume, so about, say, 23 microliters to start, remeasure, and see where the concentration is at. Um, the reason for doing it this way a little bit stepwise is so that we don't fall below 20 micrograms per mil because now then we'll have to do the opposite where we add more RNA, probably overshoot, and then have to bring the concentration back down again. So to avoid repeating these steps, um, 
I'm going to slowly uh, bring the concentration closer to 20 micrograms per mil. Right, so 20.1, so we're almost exactly at 20 micrograms per mil. Um, so as you've seen here, it is quite common to have to uh, adjust this several times um, to get the concentration just right. Okay, so now that we have our RNA standard at the right concentration, we can start plating our standard. So First, um, I'm going to uh, add TE into each of the standard wells so that we can then add the RNA standard to the TE, and then I'll end with Triton. Um, and this is all listed in the table in the RiboGreen protocol. Okay, so I'm just going to start plating all of my TE. So the standard is going to be plated in rows F and G, and I'm going to plate them from largest to uh, smallest concentration. So the first one is 25 microliters of TE, then 40 microliters. And so that's our plate setup for now. Uh, the next step in our protocol is to incubate the plate at 37, um, and that will help the Triton to break up uh, the LMPs in the Triton wells, and uh, then we can continue the assay. All right, so this plate is going to go into the oven at 37 degrees for 10 minutes. All right, so now that the plate is out of the oven, it's good to leave it for about five minutes uh, on the bench to let it cool to room temperature before opening it up. Um, but now we're ready to start preparing our ribogreen reagent. So the first thing we need to do is calculate how much of the ribogreen reagent we need to prepare for the plate. So I'll start by figuring out how many wells we need to add ribogreen. So that's going to be all of the wells that have TE, all the wells that have Triton, and the standard. So we have uh, four samples plus a blank, so five columns, and then two TE rows and two Triton uh, rows. So that's uh, four rows in total of 20 wells. Plus five standards in duplicate is 10. So we have 30 wells that we need uh, ribogreen reagent in. I'm going to add, uh, assume we have about four wells extra, just to give us a little bit more room for pipetting. So I'm going to prepare enough as if we had 34 wells. Now we need 100 microliters of ribogreen for each well. So that's going to take uh, 3,400 microliters of ribogreen in total with a 1 to 100 dilution of ribogreen reagent to TE. So uh, that's, that'll mean 34 microliters of our ribogreen reagent added to TE to make up a total volume of 3,400. So I'm going to use a multi-channel pipette to add 100 microliters uh, to every well that gets ribogreen. Just make sure that you don't add any ribogreen into row A because that's not where the samples are going to be measured.
Okay, so now that the ribogreen has been added, uh, just wait five minutes and then uh, the plate is ready to read. All right, so the last step we have before we're ready to read the plate is just to make sure we don't have any bubbles um, because that can affect the fluorescence reading. So the way to get rid of them is just to use a needle in case you have any bubbles. And you're going to find these specifically in the wells that have Triton, so either the sample or the standard. So these ones are pretty good because we're using reverse pipetting, but if there is any error in pipetting and uh, air got in there, you can use uh, a needle. And now that the plate is ready, you can refer to the ribogreen protocol because there's a list of uh, plate reader settings uh, that we recommend for reading this plate. So I have my um, software open here, and I'm just going to input the parameters based on the ribogreen protocol. So we want to read this in fluorescence mode, and when I click OK, I want to input the excitation and emission wavelengths, which are 485 and 528. So these are already default in this software. Uh, the optics position, we're going to do a top read, which is also the default in this software. I'm going to change the gain to 55 and change the uh, read height to 8 millimeters. And then I'll click our OK. For this assay, we don't need to set up any temperature, shake, or dispense, so I'm just going to click through, and that will open up my the port for the plate. And once the plate is loaded, I'm just going to click OK. And it started reading the fluorescence from the plate. So in row A, we don't really see any signal because we didn't add any ribogreen reagent, so we, it has very low background. And now that the TE and Triton wells have started to be read, you can see that there's much more signal coming from the Triton wells because this is measuring the total RNA whereas the TE wells are only measuring the unencapsulated mRNA. So this is actually what you want to see, where uh, the majority of the signal is in the Triton wells with very little signal in the TE wells, because this indicates high encapsulation efficiency. Okay, and you can save your data and export it and do the calculations uh, in Excel afterwards. Hope everyone got uh, a lot out of that. So let's go through the Excel sheet and how to do the calculations. Um, so bear with me. I know going through Excel <laughs> can be tedious. Uh, but yeah, so part of like when we do training with any equipment, um, like it's not just always how to run the equipment, it's also how to do these assays and measure encapsulation also. You know, so anyone you know who has nano or nano assembler platform has access to um, this Excel sheet I'm about to go over with you. Uh, so yeah, so what you'll see here that I, I have it open on my screen here. I I hope everyone can see it. Okay, um, but in the in the Excel file, there'll be three different sheets. Um, one is plate setup, uh, which is basically gives you a template for where you want to put all the values that are in your 96 well plate. Um, the other one is RNA quantification, which is where you're going to put your actual values and where the calculations will be done. And the other one is uh, your dilution factor um, calculation to calculate, um, ultimately you, you diluted the sample so to, to calculate how much that sample was diluted. Uh, but let's start by going through plate setup first, and then we'll go through each one of these um, in order. So in, in green here, kind of the, it's green because this, this indicates where you would enter values into, and then the blue is, is where all the, um, the output 
outputs would be from Excel. So first thing you look at is um, right here. So you'll see, uh, so you can see here's your sample ID and you see this is without Triton and this is with Triton. So this will be not lysed cells. So this will be the RNA that's on the outside of the particles and this will be your, um, sorry, so it's the, it's your, your lysed particles. So this will be the total uh, amount of RNA both inside and outside. So what you can see here as you see, it says sample one through 11. So because you have a 96 well plate, you could do up to 11 different samples on one plate. Uh, so 11 different columns. And then the 12th column is always gonna be used for your blanks, both your um, TE blank and then your Triton blank as well. So, and then, and here's where you, you put your dilution factor, which I'll show you how to calculate. Now in the sample that Andrew had done, he did four samples, uh, so the, the four rows, sorry, four columns or the four different samples and the fifth column was the blanks. So as far as where you put in your information for your blanks, like here's where you put in your information from your standard curve and then you have your blank from your, um, your Triton and then also the blank from just your TE buffer because uh, that ultimately gets subtracted out. Um, from your, from your readings. And I'll show you that when we get to the actual calculations. All right, so how you do dilution factor. So you remember Andrew did two different concentrations. He did the samples one and two, where it's just the standard, it was brought back to the, to the same um, volume as, as coming off of the, of the nanosimilar. And then he had another sample uh, that he concentrated it three times further. So one of the samples he took um, 15 microliters. So he took 15 microliters and added it into row A. Um, so when he did that, he diluted it 15 microliters into a total of 250 microliters, which was the volume in row A. And then he aliquoted from that into the um, rows B, C, D, and E. So he took 50 microliters into what was a total um, of 200 microliters. So when he took 15 microliters um, and added to row A, that was a dilution factor of 66.7. And then when he did the more concentrated sample, he only took five microliters and then he had a higher dilution factor of 200. So the reason the dilution factor is important is when you're doing the readings in the, in the plate, it's gonna obviously give you the concentration in the plate. And then you wanna um, multiply that reading times your dilution factor to figure out what your starting concentration was. All right, so now doing those calculations. Um, so here, so you see this is the same setup as this. I just This is just where you put in your actual values. So here is his, his um, uh, columns one and two, so samples one and two, and then columns three and four, where he had his, uh, his, his normal and then his more concentrated mRNA LNPs. So first thing you notice, so the, the, the um, values without train, so the non-lysed particles, you get a lower reading, uh, a lower fluorescence, because obviously this is just the RNA that's not inside the particles. And then the with triton, that's obviously a much higher reading, because uh, that's where your particles are lysed. So this includes everything both inside and outside the particles. Um, so that's, that's your two values there. And then with your blanks, what you'll see, so this was your blank with Triton and this was your blank without Triton. So the first thing you notice is that the blank, so this is just your PBS and Triton, this is just your PBS and TE buffer. So this was column five that Andrew had done. Uh, this was row D and E and this is row B and C. Uh, but you notice that with Triton is a higher fluorescence than without. So you can see right away that the Triton does give a little bit of fluorescence. So what you were going to do, um, and I won't go into all the you know, backgrounds of the calculations, basically the with train, we're going to subtract out the, the fluorescences from train, and then without train, we'll subtract out their fluorescences um, from, from, from just the TE buffer. And the same with our standards, because our standards have 
trade in them as well. Uh, so we'll subtract out uh, the average of these values from our standard readings too. And then what that'll give us is, um, it'll also, so what it'll give us, it'll give us our encapsulation efficiency. And our encapsulation efficiency is a measure of the percentage difference between our with and without Triton readings. Um, and then because we have a standard curve, we can, uh, it's a linear standard curve and here's our equation for the curve. It's just, I say curve, it's just a line. It's just Y equals MX plus B. And then you can get R squared just to give an indication of the, of the fit. Um, so you'll plug your absorbance values into that standard curve and that'll give you a total concentration reading. So that's the total amount of RNA both inside and outside the, the particle. But what we, what we really care about is the amount of encapsulated RNA because that's what our dose is going to be based on for doing any further in vitro or in vivo studies. Uh, so that's calculated by our total amount times our encapsulation efficiency. And that gives us our encapsulated mRNA concentration, which ultimately is our, is our working concentration. And here you can see here, um, you know, this is, this is just a standard mRNA LMP coming off of the nano assembler. And then um, here you can see the more concentrated um, <clears throat> LMPs, LMPs here. Uh, so that's all. Well, thank you, Jason. Hi, everybody. Uh, thanks, Jason, for the wonderful presentation. And thanks to Andrew for actually walking through all the different steps uh, involved in a riboguin assay. I'm sure this will be helpful for a number of, uh, of, our, uh, of our customers who are new to this or, or somebody who have been doing it for some time, even for those just uh, knowing all the nitty gritty. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. I hope, I hope you learned a lot and look forward to working with a lot of you too. Thank you very much.